Hello everybody, uh, my name is Vanessa Nord, I'm Head of Exhibitions at the AA and firstly I'd like to say thank you for braving the suitably Arctic conditions to come to a lecture by ScanLab Projects who are Matthew Shaw and William Trossel. Um, I saw their work first last year in Venice actually where they'd scanned um, Howard Tompkins' Young Vic and um, they, they have this, I was thinking about maybe it's my way of thinking about technology. I was thinking, oh, they really transcend the technology. But actually, I think what they've taught me is that technology can be beautiful. The images that they come up with from their 3D scanning of projects have this really beautiful quality, I think, a real kind of sensitivity about the environment, about the object they're scanning. The exhibition that we've got next door, which um, is on until February the 9th, is a project um, that they undertook with Cambridge University and Greenpeace. They went to the Arctic, to the North Fram Strait, which is northwest as Svalbard in Norway, and they traveled on the Greenpeace icebreaker, the Arctic Sunrise. They scanned a total of 26 um, ice flows, and we have scale replicas that are made um, next door, which actually melt very quickly. So after the show, I recommend going to see one of the really beautiful bits of Stamuka, the piece next door, and it really is lovely. They do disappear very quickly, so make sure you get in there and see it. You think in this weather it wouldn't freeze at all, but it, it is. Um, so it pe the, I think the exhibition really repays staying in there a little bit longer as well. It's, it's kind of very visually arresting and beautiful, but when you read some of the text, um, you, can, you can get a kind of idea of the scope of this project, which is really a very important ex expedition, and the idea, the remit behind it is to save the Arctic. It's an environment that's under huge risk. Um, so on behalf of Greenpeace, you, you should go and visit their website and sign up to the Save the Arctic campaign. Um, there's lots of very interesting things to learn in the exhibition. One of the things I learned that um, they're not icebergs, they're ice flows. Icebergs actually fresh water, as are authentically made in salt water. There you go. Um, I'm going to hand you over now to Matt and to Will, who are going to talk about this Arctic Works project and some other really interesting projects they've been working on recently. So I'd like to thank them on behalf of the AA for joining us tonight. Thanks. Thank you. Cool. Is the microphone working? Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. Cool. Thank you very much um, to Ness and to everybody at the AA for having us here this evening, but also for, um, for helping us out and for giving us the space to show the exhibition, um, which is next door, which we obviously encourage everybody to have a little look at. Um, so my name is Matt, and this is Will. We run ScanLab Projects, which is kind of a two-fold entity, really. Um, maybe becoming more of a three-fold entity. We're a kind of research and teaching uh, partnership at the Bartlett School of Architecture. Um, we are a commercial practice offering 3D scanning to architects, engineers, the creative industries, um, the film industry, all sorts of um, all sorts of people really have become our clients over the last two and a half years. And increasingly, we're a practice, a, a kind of design practice led by 3D scanning as, as the starting point for some of our projects. This evening, we'll very quickly introduce the technology behind 3D scanning because there's a whole kind of number of 3D scanning systems out there. We use a particularly a particular type of 3D scanning called terrestrial laser scanning. Um, we'll run through that technology quickly. We'll then kind of run through a few of the more commercial projects that we've done, I guess, and then emphasize a lot of the um, expedition and the work that's gone behind the ex exhibition next door. The ex exhibition of an expedition <laughs> is always a tricky one. Um, um, we're actually going to end with another um, project, hopefully leading to an exhibition in progress as well. So this is kind of what we do. The image on the screen is a 3D scan of a ship. The ship is the Arctic Sunrise, which belongs to Greenpeace. It's their icebreaker, which um, hosted the expeditions up to the Fram Strait in 2011 and 2012. Uh, what you're looking at here is not just one single 3D scan. It's something like 56 individual scans all compiled together. So just to talk a wee bit more about how, these, how this scanning process actually happens. We have an instrument which um, is kind of sci-fi looking instrument which we pop down on a tripod. Um, it fires up to a laser, a little bit like a 
distance measurer that you guys might have used to just measure one individual distance in a room. So it fires out that laser, hits a surface, and measures the distance from the scanner to that point on a surface. It then moves in a little bit, fires a laser again, measures another point. It does this process up to a million times a second. So firing out these, this laser and measuring millions and millions of individual points to a, a very high level of accuracy. Um, as, as, the, as the laser kind of fires out, it fires out almost in an arc. So we essentially create a section line, and then the whole instrument spins around on its axis on the tripod. So what we're looking at on the screen here is a 3D scan in someone's living room. There's a kind of circle in the middle of the space there, which is where the scanner sits on its tripod. So you'll see these little circles. They pervade our work. They're these little kind of spots underneath the tripod where we can't see the scan. Um, I'll just kind of zoom in a wee bit as well. So you can see objects within a meter and a half there, something like the guitar and the, um, and the pillow there. We're starting to get points kind of closer than every millimeter, I'd say. So every kind of little pixelated dot you can see on the screen there is an individual point that we've 3D scanned. They're accurate to within at this sort of range to within one millimeter, maybe two millimeters. Um, and the machine itself, it easily copes with a room like this, maybe 10 meters long by 4 meters wide. Um, the range on the instrument that we use most commonly is kind of stated at a maximum of 120 meters, but really we, we kind of find a working range of about 30 to 40 meters normally for the scans. So we build up these models out of millions and millions and millions of precisely measured points. As well as being precisely measured, those points are also colored. The, the scanner essentially has a built-in camera, so we take color information in exactly the same way that you might take a photograph. We capture the light conditions in exactly the state that they are in when you're in that space. So it's quite a time-based activity, really. When we're, when we're looking at this living room here, we're not just looking at the, that living room like a surveyor might look at that living room. We're looking at it in the exact kind of moment in time when we went into that space, when we captured that space. Um, the scanner also can't see through stuff. So you can see in this image here, there's a kind of several shadows being cast by, for example, the sofa. So the way that we get around that is we start to link scans together. So we pop the scanner off in one location. The scan takes about 10, 15 minutes. We then move to another location and link the scans together using a whole series of different reference objects. So in, in this particular instance, this is three scans on the ground floor, another couple of scans on the first floor of this building, and then we've kind of crept outside, so first scan up on the roof, second scan up on the roof, a first scan in the street, a second and a third scan in the street. So we're looking at maybe half a day's worth of time on, on site on that particular job. Um, and in, in this particular instance, this is a, a surveying job for a, a small experimental architecture practice. We're actually looking to insert a prefabricated steel structure directly above this building, so it kind of nestles above and, and sits on the existing roof structure. So this model kind of starts to get pulled apart. They start to analyze it for the structure that the building has. They start to analyze the in inhabitation below, but also start to use this model for kind of rights of light modeling and that sort of thing. So we tend to kind of deliver this as a, as a 3D model. This is a piece of 3D um, information that can go straight into a design program that all sorts of architects and engineers are very comfortable in using. But we've also kind of taken the survey drawing to hopefully another level where we're not just surveying the, the kind of position of walls in a building, but we're p surveying the position of post-it notes on people's books and the title on the books and the pieces of fruit in the fruit bowl. And there's a kind of strange level of um, invasive truth about these snapshots in, in time of a building, but also of the kind of occupation of the building. So on a kind of commercial basis, I guess, we, we deliver to our clients these embedded um, 3D data sets which, within which we put the kind of 2D plan drawings, 2D section drawings. Um, and inc I mean, it's, uh, it's not the most easily accessible technology to start working with, but we are, we're, we're going through the first few projects with architects now where they're finding this is massively beneficial and completely changing the, the kind of start process for a design. This is one of those projects that I'll talk about super quickly purely just the survey work, really. 
Um, this is Larkstoke Manor, which is in the Cotswolds, and uh, Niall McLaughlin and Architects were commissioned to start completely reorganising this structure. It's, it's so old that um, the original farmhouse is actually mentioned in the Doomsday Book, but the, the state of the farmhouse on this site has changed kind of immeasurably over the course of um, hundreds of years. So the first process for them really was to, to, to 3D scan the entire site and, um, and buildings on there. There's a kind of three-storey plus basement and a small two-storey building annex. And then start to dissect when these different bits of the, the structure were built, what they're used for at the moment, how they link to each other. So this is a kind of standard thing that we might deliver to an architect. You get your, the drawing that you're, that you're working with on a day-to-day -day basis, but actually when you're speaking to a client about that drawing, this drawing is so much more useful because they, when they see that, they understand how they use that space. That's their space. They kind of, they belong to a space that looks like that as opposed to a drawing that looks a wee bit more like that. Um, I'm going to pop you over to Will now. He's going to talk about another project. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, so this is part of the Science Museum and is uh, one of the Got few large galleries in the Science Museum, which like brings back so many memories of my childhood of running through the Science Museum and looking at all of these amazing models. This is the shipping gallery, which has since been decommissioned and is making way for a new and exciting exhibition about communication and information in the Science Museum. And we were asked uh, by the Science Museum to create a digital archive of the museum, um, a focus on the entire space and some of the thousands of exhibits which are stuffed into this space. So we've just about to launch uh, very soon uh, this animation of which we've got a little snippet of. So I'll, I'll let it play through. But you can see here like it's full of all of the model boats made by tens of granddads and dads in their sheds. There's replicas of steam engines, paddles, propellers. There's everything you could ever think about which would be associated with maritime is there in this gallery. So we were there after hours and we spent about a week looking through this, arriving at kind of 6 p.m., leaving about 9 a.m. And it was a really amazing experience to be in that space for that long, to really kind of get to grips with all these amazing exhibits. So where this is going now is looking at being able to make an, a digital replica of uh, an exhibition which so this one is not there anymore, but has a huge importance for our almost national heritage here. Um, so we've got a few things that we'd like to do with this uh, in terms of recording and actually taking back and putting to paper some of the wealth of information that people have which exists beyond this uh, exhibition. All of the people, all of people's photos and all the personal accounts which relate to some of the exhibits here. Um, so I'll just go through a few of the, the plans. Sorry, oh. nothing's coming through. You're not here. hearing me. Sorry. How's that? Can you hear me? If I do a one, two, three. Yeah. Okay. Lovely. Ah, okay. Now I've got two things to hold. I don't know if my brain can do what I... Right. <laughs> um, so here we have a plan. And as Matt was explaining earlier, we can take our drawings from whichever view we fancy. We can start cutting bits up. We can start revealing the inner workings of the gallery how, to our heart's content. And so these are just some shots that we've begun to extract from the model. But what we'd really like to do is be able to allow people to input information back in, make an interactive drawing where people could identify objects in the museum and start adding information about them into that, making a sort of public archive in a way. Um, and so those, those were the short sections, and here are very obviously the long sections through that part of the gallery. And you can see it's just absolutely stuffed full of amazing bits and bobs. Um, and so I'll just zoom through a few of the final things. But uh, what's really interesting is the fact that we can also isolate bits and bobs. And we're thinking this could be an amazing way of making extra interactive elements so you could come back and pick up on something here. This is the one of the first steam turbines that ever went into a boat here. This is, came out of a, a jet engine from uh, parts of the Second World War. So it's an amazing archive of bits and bobs, and we'd love to continue to do lots of stuff across the world with museums. I think I'm passing back to you. Yeah. Uh, am I all mic'd up on this one? Cool. Oh, okay. 
Sorry, Will. Um, I think what's kind of important about that last project as well is that so that gallery space doesn't exist anymore now. It's, it's been completely dissolved. Those, o those models have gone back to all of their owners. And yet there's this kind of strange forensic uh, copy of that space as it was, the exhibits, but also the way that those exhibits were laid out. And it's playing quite an important role in the memory of that space, certainly for the Science Museum. They've got, um, I don't know if it's hundreds, but tens of people whose lives almost depended on that gallery. They loved that gallery so much. They'd visit it kind of on a weekly basis and still discover new things. And the, the way that hopefully this kind of digital archive of it will, will keep that space alive for them, I think is quite interesting. This is another exhibition um, which we won't dwell on too much. Um, it's the Bartlett Summer Show from a couple of years ago. Um, you guys have possibly seen some of the animations that we've created. We've, we've scanned the Bartlett Summer Show every year when it's been um, installed for the seven days which is held in, in the kind of end of June. Um, but we wanted to kind of talk about this project a little bit more just to start to um, kind of critique, I guess, 3D scanning as a new form potentially of um, photography. We're, we're certainly finding as we explore this technique parallels with the ways of working and the ways of, of viewing that we imagine early photographers started to see. So the, the difference between these two slides here is this is a set of color scans all linked together quite, um, quite successfully explaining a series of spaces. This is just one of those individual scans, exactly kind of raw as it comes out of the 3D scanner. So um, what we don't have here is any of the color information. What we also don't have here um, are the surrounding scans. So the nature of the scan and its ability not to see through anything, but only to kind of survey a, a skin of its, its surroundings, starts to become much more apparent, I think, in this image and this kind of series of images. So the, the idea of shadow casting from the scanner becomes quite interesting here. The idea of light sources becomes quite interesting as well because um, certain objects are closer to the scanner, they get scanned in more detail. So in these images here, the, the white spot down there isn't necessarily any whiter than something on the kind of left of the image there. It's just brighter because it's got more points on it. So there's less distance between the points that we're seeing in these images here. Um, so I guess the other kind of strange um, parallel with photography is that when we take the, the scan, we do one thing, we set up the machine and, and, it, and it takes its photograph and there's very little we can do to change that. The, the machine sees what it sees. It has its own kind of quite specific point of view. But there is a kind of set of processing that we do, not in a dark room, but a, a very digital set of processing where we take that 3D data and then we start to, to, start to curate views from that data. So there's quite a kind of, um, a, a, curatorial and editorial process that can go on in there. And this idea of using the machine to, to cast shadows and to, to define a site that's much more specific than, than um, the space as it, as it is, but is a site that's only kind of seen by the machine, I guess, is quite interesting. This is another way of looking at exactly the same scan as we see in this photograph here. Um, but rather than looking at that data in three dimensions, we're looking at it unfolded in two dimensions. So this is what we call a planar image. It's everything that the scanner can see flattened out onto one piece of paper. Um, and if we start to kind of zoom into that, then you start to see a little bit more about how these images are made. So every pixel in that image is, a, is not just a pixel in an image, it's a point in space with an X value, a Y value, and a Z value. And I wanted to talk about this image as well because it starts to talk about scale. Everything that we've shown so far is kind of of a, um, an architectural scale, a, a room size scale. Um, 3D scanning like this doesn't just happen on the scale of buildings. It actually happens on the scale of cities. So a machine not dissimilar to the one that we use on a daily basis can be fixed to the underside of an airplane or to the back of a car and can scan live as that vehicle moves either across or along or through a city. So what we're looking at here is a, albeit a pretty low resolution version of a 3D scan of London. Um, so the 3D scanner sat on the underside of, in this case, a, an aeroplane as it tracks across the city and it's scanning downwards and measuring the heights of buildings. So we're not talking about the same level of resolution. You're not going to need to worry about post-it notes and, and the, the, the information on them from an aerial scan, but it's a, it's, yeah, but it is a, <laughs> 
a phenomenally kind of rapid way of gathering 3D information about urban spaces and, and landscapes and essentially the world. Um, and we're super, super interested in this idea that digital versions of cities start to exist and coexist alongside the physical versions. Um, and they're digital versions that at the moment are kind of only being updated by professionals and then semi-professionals like us. Um, but actually, the, the ability for amateurs to start to, to edit these virtual versions of cities, I think is quite a in increasingly interesting and important, um, important move. This, this image here was, is about five or six years old, actually. It's one of the images from my master's at the Bartlett. Um, and it's the very first bit of large-scale 3D scanning data that we got, actually, from... I've just seen Mona in the audience. One of her colleagues, Stuart Robson, handed us over this 3D data set. This image is of the same part of London. We're just outside Parliament here, and this is something that we um, did when we first got our hands on our first scanner. Um, what we're doing here is scanning, but we're not doing a lot of the editing that we would normally do to our scans. So in the very, very center of the image here, you can see the tiny little dot, which is where the scanner is. The very extent of this sphere of information is about 150 meters. It's the very maximum that, that the scanner um, records information at. And you can see towards the center of the image the outline of buildings. But actually, what we've kind of chosen to include here are a lot of the mistakes that the scanner makes as well. These are mistakes that we kind of know pretty well and we get rid of quite a lot of the time. They're, things, they're kind of echoes almost. It's to do with the way that the scanner sends out different wavelengths of infrared laser to capture its data. And it, it tends to make mistakes, that, but make them at distinct kind of wavelengths. So you get these echoes of things that it's scanned. Um, we're, we're very interested in this because although the technology at the moment takes a lot of kind of man management and a lot of processing, that's something that will always become more and more automated in the future. And the ability for errors like this to get mistaken as truths, I think, is quite an interesting thing. This is the same, exact same scan, but rather than shown in plan, it's shown in section. So this kind of halo of, of noise and unscanned um, bizarreness is, is the scanner very rarely makes a, a mistake unless there's something there. It, it, it doesn't really scan nothing. It scans, it makes some mistakes because of the wavelengths that it's sending out, but generally speaking, it's seeing something. Um, so, they, I don't know, the, the images um, just give us some sort of space to start thinking about those things, I guess. Um, this is a, if, if this project here starts to be a little bit politically motivated because of its location and because of the, the way that it's examining London and, and Parliament, this project here is definitely a politically motivated one. Um, this is something that we're doing with forensic architecture, E.O. Wiseman um, and Susan and Francesca and the guys over at Goldsmiths. Um, we, we went to this site here, which is um, an ex-concentration camp from the Balkans War um, near a town called Amaska in Bosnia. Um, we went there as um, essentially photographers um, and we had a permit and were allowed to go and uh, essentially do a bit of filming in and around this white building here, which is known as the White House. Um, it's one of a series of buildings on this site, which is owned by Eslaw Mattel, the steel giants. Um, it's run as a steel mine, uh, sorry, as an as a, um, iron ore mine at the moment. Um, but it, it was in the past used as a concentration camp in the Balkans War, and the White House was, is rumored to be one of the rooms or one of the buildings that was used um, most predominantly for torture and execution. Um, its status at the moment is, is heavily contested because um, Aeson and Mattel obviously want to carry on with their, their processing in that plant, but there's a lot of um, families and a lot of survivors who would like to see this whole site turned into a memorial. So we, were, we went in under the, the guise of a film crew, I guess, with permission to um, film around this, this one individual building. And, Partly because of the kind of newness of this technology, people will believe um, it is a camera, even though it's actually got powers beyond a camera. So um, in a slightly subversive manner, I guess, when taking the film of this White House, what we've actually done is capture a, um, I wouldn't say forensically accurate, but certainly a forensic snapshot of, of this uh, building and its setting and its surroundings at the time that we were allowed to go there. This is a kind of zoomed-in version of the, of the building as we found it. Um, 
it's very much as it was when um, when it kind of regained status as a mine. Um, and the only kind of traces in this building at the moment are traces from when survivors have actually been allowed back into that space. So there's kind of the odd rows left in the corner and there's kind of little notes and, and, and things like that. But it's an ongoing project. Um, it's a project that's allied with another set of, um, of scanning that happened in Belgrade on the same trip, looking at another concentration camp from the Second World War. Um, but although it's quite a somber one, I think it's quite important to note that these are the other, there are forensic uses of this technology out there. The work with forensic architecture on the one hand is stuff that will be used um, in potentially in war crimes tribunals in the future, but it's also something that they and we see as having a value um, visually to start communicating ideas. And that's very much the aim of this project with forensic architecture and with those guys is to turn these into visuals, not just um, kind of hidden away bits of evidence. Um. I think it's possibly an important point to add into yeah. that would be is that the the laws behind 3D scanning and what you can do and what you can't do haven't yet kind of caught up with the technology. It's almost kind of an invasion of people's privacy because of the way the scanner will go through glass. You can see if you were scanning along on the back of a car through the street, you'd be able to see very clearly into people's houses and people's hotels and everything, really. So there's an interesting side to that which comes off the back of this that is quite scary, but it's also quite interesting. And we'd certainly like to kind of explore that but without getting ourselves in trouble. <laughs> but I think it, we're, it's not something that we're ever sh like shying away from. In this particular project, OK, there was a certain amount of kind of stealth involved in what we were allowed to do. Um, but we would never, uh, I think that conversation needs to be had and I'm hoping that conversation does start to get provoked because uh, there are gonna be, um, we've done another short project which we don't talk about here but we went out with a group of Bartlett students over the summer and blatantly stole details from famous architects. So we'd pop our scanner down in front of a Zaha building, scan in as much detail as we could a detail and then go back to the workshop and use the CNC machines to completely copy it to almost a millimetre level of perfection, you know, and being purposefully blatant about doing that in front of the gherkin, and I think starting, you know, we might start a sideline in, in detail theft and going around and building up this catalogue of details that you can tell to people, but, you know, there's, I think unless we start doing these things, then it, um, it, it's not going to get noticed and that discussion is not going to happen, so, anyway, off and Um this is another project um, that talks about scale a wee bit more, I guess. This is, um, we're, we're kind of really, um, haven't been involved in this project too much yet, um, but we hope to be involved a little bit more. This is Liam Young of Tomorrow's Thoughts Today. Uh, this is the project Under Tomorrow's Skies. Um, and in a way, this is a kind of scaleless model. Um, it actually does have a, well, I don't know if it does have a distinct scale, it has a kind of physical scale in that what we're looking at here is about six metre by six metre square. Um, the model was scanned when it was on exhibition in Eindhoven about uh, three months ago, four months ago. Um, and it's an imagined landscape and a kind of fragment of imagined world that is continuously being evolved and designed by architects and by filmmakers and by model makers and by set designers. Um, it's also a, a model of a, of a kind of future city that intentionally was made so that it could be well scanned. So this, um, this landscape, for example, doesn't have any undercuts. So it's the perfect landscape for 3D scanning from the air. Um, it also uh, it has always been intended to have a kind of digital sibling. So there'll be a physical version of this model, but there'll also be a digital version of this model. And the design will happen on both of those things simultaneously. And it's kind of, um, the, kind of the idea behind that project is as well that and the idea behind that city that, that the um, architects and the designers are hypothesizing is that the digital version of the city will be as important as the, as the physical version of the city in the future. So again, a project kind of in its, in its starting moments and even just with the animation here, we find this quite frustrating because you're looking at it as an object and we're desperate to render out the fly through where you actually get inside and you're starting to inhabit that landscape. Um, but it'll come, it'll come. There you go, sir. Um, so this, this is a really nice image because it was one of the first ones that we were doing and actually 
came out of the, the first sort of section of work that we did with the scanner. Um, when it arrived uh, as a research tool uh, at UCL, um, Farah, who make the scanner, were interested to see what architects and designers would do with it. And they were quite happy that engineers and surveyors would go out and use it in the sort of traditional sense, but they had no idea what an architect, given a scanner, would do. How would they use it as a design tool? Um, they gave it to us, and they, they, they got quite a few interesting things back. I don't think they were expecting. Um, we were really interested to see what would happen when you scanned a reflection. You know, what would happen if you put the scanner in front of a big, curvy mirror? W what will it do to its perception of space? So this, this image here is, as you can see, the little tripod in the center of the room is where the scanner was set up. And within one corner, we set up a humongous kind of 8 by 4 sheet of uh, shiny mirror uh, and just set it going. And, and these were the results. It was absolutely fantastic. Um, and they also mentioned that you know, when they dropped off the scanner, not to try and scan black things because they don't scan very well, or don't try anything glossy because the reflections are really bad. And hey. Sorry, I knew that was going to happen Ooh. as well. I didn't know what to do, I had to cough. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm really sorry. That was worse. Oh. <laughs> sorry. Did I break everything? <laughs> Well, if you were asleep, you're not now. <laughs> um, does that, shall I, shall I just project? I'll try and project. Okay. My, no, mine's not working. But. Sorry. Sorry. You'll be taken outdoors and shot. Can I ask what the etiquette is to do when you need to cough and you've got a microphone? You just hold it. Um... Yeah, so they were saying to not scan it, don't try it, um, and it's, that's exactly what we did. And that was like the crux of why we started doing what we did, because it was absolutely amazing. Um, at that point, we were also scratching our heads to wonder whether we could scan uh, a cloud. Could we contain a cloud in a room, set the scanner off, and see if it would actually see it? And to our absolute amazement, you could. And this is uh, a huge room that we'd filled with uh, a cloud and let loose to billow towards the scanner, and you can see it just capturing that. Um, and again here, um, we were trying to contain things in the box in front, and then we just let them loose and let the scanner do its work. Um, and that led me nicely uh, to spark off loads of ideas. Um, my obsession that year was with the weather, and trying to record the weather, trying to uh, draw the weather, and trying to make weather. Um, and we were given Kilda as a residency uh, and a site for speculation at, during my fifth year. Um, and I found this fantastic site in the middle of the forest where two trees had been pushed over by a, a sort of sudden downburst of wind. Um, and what is normally a very barren landscape of very regimentally planted trees, you suddenly have this absolutely phenomenally luminous green uh, center a kind of clearing in the forest. Um, and Kilda is a manufactured forest. Like all of the paper and pulp that comes out there is planted, and it's a huge reserve of trees, several million acres worth, I believe. Uh, and trying to take that space back to the studio, I really wanted to be able to map, I really wanted to be able to install and predict and prototype things. So the scan which I did of that very site is of this image here and led into mapping and being able to control that space and, and place things back in it. Um, and what I really wanted to do, uh, and to cut a, a long story short about what the project was, was that I was making a rainbow machine to place back in that site. Um, so like a kind of mystical thing that you think is in the forest and is left there, this machine is left out um, to compress its own energy from the variance in temperature between day and night and stores rainwater. And components which I cast in aluminium would be embedded into the trees to make it quite permanent. But uh, back in the studio, I was sort of testing how the, how the rainbow would work, where you needed to be. And at that point, the scan was the perfect kind of uh, site model to be able to predict where you needed to be 
it's quite mathematical where you need to have the sun, the mist, and the observer to observe the rainbow. So that was all perfectly planable. I could work out where you needed to be. And that became the design. The design was mapping where you needed to be and where all the rest of the components were. Um, and this is the prototype up at the, uh, in the UCL quad as I plumbed it in uh, on which was a lovely sunny day, luckily. Um, and that was where the space and the scan uh, and the prototypes all collided. And it was a 3D world where I could prototype things and install things and test them and uh, put them in. Um, and then eventually we went back with the machine, installed it, uh, and scanned the result. Uh, and there we go. Also, uh, alongside our commercial practice, we, as Matt was sort of talking about earlier, we... Is this working? Yes. Um, we also teach and do research at UCL. And I won't try and talk over this too much, but this is a fantastic film made by Dan Tassel of our most recent workshop in Kilda. Um, we had four groups, all of three students, uh, and they were given a site and told to produce a film. And the film media would be scanning, and they had, we only gave them about 36 hours to find, scan, reduce an animation. And they did some fantastic stuff. Uh, we had all sorts of amazing equipment, and there's little snippets here of some of the interesting It was a, an amazing long weekend and forms part of two workshops I'm doing this year. This first one was about film capture. Um, the second one will be about insertion, and is where we'll be going back to Gilda, finding a spot, scanning, and fabricating something to fit wonderfully perfectly into that space that we would never be able to do without the tools and the technology that we have here. Um, <laughs> this is one of the harvesting machines that they now use. So rather than chain gangs of uh, transformers they just slice through it with this automatic machine which is um I don't think so, I think it's probably from on the road and it's all um No, I meant the whole actual one. The whole actual one, these ones. Yeah, these are amazing. I'd love to show you these. Um this is, uh, I forget their names, but they were really, really sorry, um, uh, come grab me afterwards and I'll tell you. But they, um, they were really interested in the sense of scale that you can be lost in in the world of CAD, um, and especially the world of points. You know, these, on some sort of conceptual levels, could be viewed as atoms, they could be at the other end of the scale, they could be galaxies, you could be here wandering through the outer universe. So what they really wanted to do was start in at that micro level and pull back out to that macro. And the audio that accompanies this was a, a fascinating moment where they took the data, which is obviously just points in space, X, Y, Z, uh, and they fed that into a computer-generated audio machine. So the sound is the space. So, so it's got a nice interesting thing. And this whole video loops, so you start it and you move around. Um, and they're all on the website. If anyone really wants to have a look, there's another three or four of these. So I'll move on. And this last one, which I'll show, is just in a, a really beautiful way where you're looking at the same space but in two perspectives at the same time, so you're looking in plan and in elevation. Yeah, I didn't mean to interrupt this video earlier, I just wanted to say what's quite lovely about this video is that, um, or the landscape that you're seeing in this video, is that this landscape doesn't actually exist. What this group of students did was take a whole series of scans which were performed by their group but also other groups um, throughout the the weekend and they actually constructed their own landscape using those fragments and, and kind of nestled them back together. It, quite a delicate exercise, you know, they, they almost went through the planning process of, of laying these different fragments out together but somehow managed to merge them together with a, with a soundtrack that gives the illusion of this 
this space and this kind of summary experience of their weekend that actually doesn't exist at all. These, these sites are up to kind of five, six miles apart um, and can't ever be viewed like this unless you view them in this kind of digital way. Cool. So, have I? Am I? Is it all good again? Cool. I promise not to cough. I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> um, so, as Will says, this is kind of, um, I guess, the reason that we're here talking to you guys today. Um, we're looking at um, an aerial photograph at about 89 degrees north um, in the Fram Strait, which is a patch of um, sea and ice to the northwest of Svalbard, which is an island off the north of Norway. Um, we're looking at an aerial photograph here of the Arctic Sunrise, Greenpeace's icebreaker ship. Um, and the reason that we're uh, looking at this aerial photograph is that it kind of si fits into a sequence of scientific readings which are being taken of this area. So the, the scientists that we were working for are based at Cambridge University uh, under the guidance of Professor Peter Wadhams. Two of the scientists that we work with on a regular basis are uh, PhD candidates Till Wagner and Nick Toberg. Um, and their research actually starts a scale zoomed out from this image. It starts by looking at satellite imagery for the polar regions, in particular the Arctic. Um, there's a couple of, or well, there's certainly one dedicated satellite called Cryosat, which is permanently mapping the, the poles, specifically with the extent of looking at ice, or with the intent of looking at ice extent. Um, the next kind of scale down in their research would be aerial photographs like this, but imagine this in, is one tile in a set of aerial photographs that might span kind of 20 miles in that direction, 20 miles in that direction, another 20 miles north and south as well. So they take gridded series of aerial photographs from the underside of a helicopter and use them to, to automatically, not by hand, trace the individual outline of, of a significant number of individual ice flows. Um, and then we would step in at, at this sort of level. So we've been on two expeditions with, um, with Greenpeace and with Cambridge, the first in September 2011 and the second in July 2012. And at this sort of scale, um, the scientists, with our help, start to look at an individual ice flow. Ideally, it's an individual ice flow that's located in one of these sets of aerial photographs and, again, located in the satellite data. So there's, there's this kind of constant trying to tie all the information together. And we kind of take over at this sort of scale. So when the, the ship would moor up to the side of an ice flow, as, as Ness mentioned earlier as well, these are ice flows, not icebergs. So an ice flow is essentially a frozen, um, the frozen skin of the ocean that's been crushed and, and cracked up and formed these individual floating islands. Um, the ship would moor to the side of one of these. We'd, we'd try and find one that was kind of a reasonable size where it was safe enough and logical enough to be able to moor to. And then we take over by stepping down onto the ice with the machine. This is actually one of the old scanners that we used to use. Um, and from the surface of the ice, measure the surface of the ice. So in exactly the same way that we would survey a building or we'd survey a landscape, we position the scanner in several positions, link those scans together, and end up with a complete 3D model of the top surface of the ice. Uh, we're looking at a flow here. All the flows are kind of pretty scientifically <laughs> named, I'm afraid. Um, this is flow A1006. It doesn't get much more exciting. Um, but it was quite exciting, <laughs> I promise. Um, this is a flow that's about 120 meters long by 80 meters wide. It's the, l it's the largest flow that we visited in both of the expeditions, actually. Um, you can see our little kind of rabbit holes from where the scanner's been. Um, and you can start to see two, or at least one, of the most important features that the scientists are interested in us capturing information about. The ridge of rubble to the kind of left-hand side of the image there is what's known as a pressure ridge. So when the top surface of the ocean freezes, you end up with a very, very kind of thin sheet of ice, sometimes only a couple of centimetres, but on the case where we're able to access them, anything between half a metre and kind of two or three metres. Due to the ocean currents, those pieces of ice start to crack up, or that, that skin of ice cracks up and then is pushed or pulled apart. When they're pushed together, you get a kind of plate tectonics action happening, so a pressure ridge, two bits of ice colliding together, bursting upwards in these ridges, but also bursting downwards as well. 
One of the other things that this, the scans are able to get capture as well is is kind of minute detail of the surface texture and the the, the kind of positions of snow on on these pieces of ice, the positions of exposed ice in ca in some cases melt ponds, which is where a pond starts to form on the top surfaces of the ice as the snow and ice melt due to the heat of the sun, as opposed to melting from the underside due to the kind of increased temperature of the oceans. This little animation here, we've, we've kind of uh, strayed away from our original animations about a year and a half ago, which were these mad hat flies through that made you feel a little bit sick. We've maybe gone a little bit too far in the other direction now, and we tend to be turning out these animations that creep about half a foot over the course of an hour. Um, but you can start to see the, some of the level of detail, I guess, that, that we're able to capture on the ice there. So you've got these vast slabs of ice, but also individual footprints there. One of the scans has got the odd polar bear dropping 3D scanned into it. Um, it. It's one of the things that we do actually when we first get to the piece of ice. It wasn't possible on this day, but we would tend to ban the science team from the <laughs> ice for the first four hours so that we could go and scan it in its perfect um, pristine condition because any scientist footprints actually start to ruin the, the surface that you're interested in studying there. Um, this image shows a whole group of tiny little people hanging around on a piece of ice. Um, and I guess it's quite an interesting point as well to talk about the other science that was going on there. So our scanner really is only good for the top side of the ice. Um, there's two different ways that the underside is measured. Um, the first most detailed and the one that we've had unfortunately least access to is um, an, AU, an, an AUV, which is an autonomous underwater vehicle. Um, with sonar fitted to it, so essentially a wee submarine that we pop off the side of the boat and it goes down underneath the ice flows. It's owned by Woods Hole Oceanographic, who are the guys that 3D scanned the Titanic and identified the Titanic and that sort of thing. Um, so they essentially use sonars looking up at the underside of the ice, um, which gives you an accuracy of maybe kind of half a meter as opposed to the accuracy on top, which we have of a couple of millimeters. The step down from that is essentially drilling holes, so drilling a hole all the way through and taking a measurement. Um, and the science guys would, would drill the hole. We have these kind of ridiculously long drill bits up to eight meters, and literally drop a tape finish down and measure. But there's, there's two different things that you're measuring. The first is the freeboard, which is the amount of ice that sits above uh, water level, and then the draft, which is the amount of ice which sits below water level, which is approximately seven times more ice underneath water level than there is above ice level. We'll all talk a little bit more about how that gets translated into the, into the models next door. And, uh, yeah. um, there's another kind of final set of readings which are taken on the ice, which are core samples uh, testing the salinity of ice. So when you get a pressure ridge, pressure ridge forming, that's two pieces of ice that weren't together, joined together now. Quite often those bits of ice are um, of, of varying ages. Um, so you can take a core sample of a piece of ice, check its salinity, and as ice ages, it loses its salinity. Um, so a piece of kind of three-year ice compared to a one-year ice will be much less saline. Um, I guess it's quite a good point, moment as well to talk about the, I might get a little animation playing uh, while I talk about that. Um, one of the importance of pressure ridges to the Arctic is that they store, a th it's, uh, it's, it's kind of only really being discovered, but it's uh, between 50 and 60 percent of the volume of ice in the Arctic is actually in these pressure ridge formations, because the rest of the ocean, the rest of the ice is, is very, very thin. It's a skin, essentially. Um, and these pressure ridges actually start to become quite solid, voluminous objects. So what that means, as well as just being more ice, is that they actually act as kind of coolant for the, for the thinner ice around them. So it's pressure ridges that have enough um, uh, cold, <laughs> I don't know if I want of a better word, um, inside them to last the summer months and to keep the rest of the ice around them cold enough to, to not melt. So s the science guys are particularly concerned when they start to see pressure ridges breaking up in the summer months. There's a couple of kind of um, quite unique experiences that happened on the, over the course of the expeditions. Um, this is a super strange piece of ice. It's, it's the largest piece of ice that you guys will see in the exhibition next door. Um, it's called a Stamuka, which is uh, the Russian name. Um, Stamuka uh, or Stamuki are um, pieces of sea ice which are at least um, a 
couple of years old. They've frozen when they're part of the ocean, but then in the summer months they tend to get beached on the shores of kind of Russia or the northern shores of, um, of Greenland, where they they kind of quite often find themselves either in strong tidal areas or in estuaries, where the where water, uh, fresh water from rivers, runs over them and drops its sediments into them. So. The reason that this looks kind of strangely terrestrial and has this kind of brown hue to it is that it's, it's got terrestrial and organic matter in it, and it's a super foreign object in a, in a very white or blue-white kind of Arctic world with nothing living, nothing brown, really. Um, so this piece of ice, the scientists were predicting, was kind of 8 to 10 years old, they thought, maybe even up to 20, did they, in the end? They were unsure unless, until they did their core samples, but... Yes, yeah, Stamuka is so large, they take about five years to get big enough to go on a beach, and then it was a bit unknown, really. Um, but some of the most interesting kind of surface texture, I guess, was coming out of these things as well. There'd be, there'd be areas where a rock would be melting its way down through the, the solid pack of ice. There'd be kind of massive areas of runoff and areas of, of windswept snow. Mm, the salt crystals and crystals on them were amazing. Like because obviously the wind there is so cold and they, they form really, really slowly. So a bit like walking into a cave of crystals, this surface was covered in them. It was like kind of walking on humongous pieces of, uh, uh, of uh, like diamond almost. It was just un unusually mountainous as well. Everything that we go to normally is super, super flat. Um, in comparison, and you can see kind of climbing ropes on here where the guys were having to be harnessed onto the side of the ice. Um, there's another quite kind of unique experience, I guess, um, as part of the, the scanning up in the Arctic with a the series of heli flows. So um, we would be uh, bundled essentially, not against our will, but not exactly uh, of our choosing, into the back of a helicopter. Um, which they didn't even stop. They'd kind of hover it above the deck of the ship. We'd grab and hug our scanner and, and dive into the back and be escorted away from kind of what we saw as home and civilization, which was the ship, which already isn't super um, homely. Um, and we'd be dropped off to a kind of ridiculously small piece of ice in something called the peripheral ice zone, which is not so far from the edge of the ice pack. Um, and it's where a lot of the kind of first stage processes of ice formation are starting to happen. Um, so the scientists are super interested in, in the kind of tiny little edges that we pick up on, on these scans here. So we're able to scan them because they're so small just with one scan. They're about netball court size, maybe a wee bit bigger, some a wee bit smaller. And they're super thin as well, so there were kind of worrying moments of cracking. And at one stage, the, ice, the helicopter pilot kind of landed nicely, gently to us told us to get on board, and then just as he pulled away, he told us to look behind, and the piece of ice that we'd been sat on had essentially disintegrated where exactly where we'd been sitting. And he'd watched this happen as he'd kind of landed and just looked us dead in the eye and was like, it's fine, you can get on board. And we didn't even notice <laughs> until we looked back. Um, but the scientists were very happy, anyway, with <laughs> the readings that they get back here, because these tiny little bits of kind of bumping and on the edges of ice flows are what they're really interested in in trying to understand the kind of formation of ice. Um, just a, f a few of the photos accompanying our exhibition. There's another exhibition upstairs, um, photos by Nick Cobbing, um, who accompanied us on the 2011 expedition. Um, he's an absolutely phenomenal Arctic or polar photographer, he calls himself. Um, these aerial photographs, this one is starting to show the, that those very first stages of ice formation. So we're looking at uh, the darker areas of a frozen skin and then the whiter areas where that frozen skin starts to kind of break up and slide over the, the um, adjoining bit of frozen skin and start to form what's called finger rafting, which then ultimately kind of builds up. You can see here like a much, th the, the, the effects of the finger, the finger rafting built up into a much thicker layer and then broken down again into an ice flow that's probably still all of these, I'd say way too, too thin to, to stand on. This is another kind of strange, mad anomaly that happens um, it, during the freezing of the ocean where those individual pieces break up into much, much smaller pieces and bounce into each other and, and form what's called pancake ice. So each of these is the size of a pancake or, or larger. They get about as big as giant water lilies. Um, this photo doesn't really do it justice in that we're on the edge of pancake ice here. You'd find yourself 
a tiny little speck in the middle of a pancake ice, and it was like honey, I shrunk the kids. You're kind of floating around in a bowl of cornflakes. It was absolutely <laughs> bizarre. And on that, on this particular day, when we're in amongst all this kind of um, pancake ice, there's a phenomenon, quite a common phenomenon, called a fog bow as well, where rainbows occur in the fog. It's pretty apt for Will's project, actually. Yeah. But the, uh, the, so all around you becomes a kind of <coughs> glowing rainbow because of the, the fog content in the air. Um, ah, OK. <laughs> uh, this is, I guess, um, one of the other reasons that we're up there. Ultimately, the, um, ultimately the, the trip is hosted by Greenpeace. Um, Greenpeace hosts a scientific expedition at least one every year to the polar regions to further investigations on the ice extent and the, the quality of the ice, uh, all the sorts of things that we've just been describing. Um, because it's a, it's a natural habitat and because it is declining. Um, this polar bear is kind of doing its best to stop that scientific process happening a wee bit. What, it's, what you're looking at there is a white reference object, which are the things that we use to tie one scan to the next, to the next, and to the next. So super, um, super precise scientific uh, pieces of kit, relatively expensive as well, um, but also smelling Delicious. beautifully yeah. of, <laughs> of human hands, which must smell a wee bit like lunch to a polar bear, I guess. So this was, uh, this was the kind of more violent play that the... Um, that the equipment got. This was a slightly kind of nicer little touch. Um, the, the, uh, the only other people we've seen behave this way with the spheres are small children. Quite often when we're scanning in public, the small children come up to polar bears, uh, come up to polar bears, come up, <laughs> just hanging out, um, come up to the spheres and just look at them as kind of massive giant lollipops and kind of pad them in exactly the same way. So then, it kind of put, it obviously puts a little bit of a hold to the science work when, whenever there's always people on polar bear watch when you're when you're working out on the ice there, um, and the obviously uh, you don't want to be hanging around on the ice when the polar bears are there. So the Greenpeace do an incredibly good job of kind of surveying and ensuring that the scientists who work up there are safe, which is very good of them. Oh yeah, we're gonna this this kind of leads I guess into uh, the exhibition. Will's just going to talk you through briefly the exhibition there. Um, this is a, we, we're starting to do one of these drawings now for each of our projects. Um, it becomes a drawing which locates the work um, ideally in entire kind of global and hopefully partially political kind of circumstances as well. So it's, um, it's a polar biased polyconic uh, projection of the world. Um, that's kind of a term that we've made up because we kind of made up this, well not made up, but we're having debates about how much of this we've made up and how much of these techniques that we've used, but we've used normal um, polyconic projection to unfold the surface of the Earth, but given it a massive bias to the polar regions and the, and the Fram Strait. Um, and then the distortion that the map shows allows us to kind of focus attentions on the area that we're interested in, and you'll see this map in a little bit more detail inside the exhibition, but it also charts the route of the Arctic sunrise, not just when it's doing polar research, but when it's been up, the up into the Amazon doing research there and in the um, southern <coughs> seas fighting um, against illegal fishing down there as well. So I think these drawings hopefully will start to play a kind of more and more important role in the, in the work, starting to give it a bit of global context. Thank you very much. Um, we've, it, in the coming photos, we've also got some of our helpers and employees and fantastic <laughs> team who have helped us out in the past. It rather intense two or three months, so they probably won't thank us for putting them in, but we would like to thank them for all their hard work. Yeah, thank in you. particular Adam and Sammy sat um, in the second row here. Well, I'll introduce them as they can pop up. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there's lots of amazing bits of in information on this, like all the sea margins, all of the... Uh, temperatures and measurements and things like that. So there's lots of stuff to go see and, and investigate further. Um, I'm going to... I see we're hugely over time, so I don't want to bore everyone, but um, I'm just going to go through some of the processes of how we've actually managed to produce what we've produced next door. Um, first of all, we meshed some of the scan data that we uh, had from the Arctic. This is the Stamuka that we were looking at earlier, um, and we made some of the largest 3D prints I've certainly ever seen, um, which were quite expensive, but we've had a bit of help with that as well. So we started out with the top surface, which we have millimeter perfect detail and information for. 
For the undersides, what we've done is interpret those holes that the scientists dug. So you can see there, those are the lines that they drilled through, uh, and that's the depth information that we've interpreted. So for the underside, it's estimations and uh, shapes based on information we do have. It's not as perfect as we have for the top, and those are the two contrasts. <coughs> In the future, hopefully, we'd like to go back and take with us more sonar equipment and divers and really kind of get to grips with actually what is underneath these pieces of amazing ice. So these are our monthly crew. These are our seven amazing uh, ice flows. Um, we've scanned in total 19 and surveyed 22, was it 26? 26. Um, but we chose seven uh, for their range of size, for their interest, uh, their, uh, t their age. There's what's known as multi-year ice up there quite often where, or less so, unfortunately, at the moment, is where ice has lasted through the melt season in the summer and refrozen again through the winter. So you might have ice that's three or four years old uh, knocking into ice that's one or two years old. So you can see the two tiny ones in the front. They're most certainly first year ice that was frozen that winter, and that is the remnants that we went to go visit in the summer. Um, the ones to the, the huge one to the left is most certainly multi year ice, which is absolutely huge. And um, so those are the underside textures and surfaces that we've modeled. Uh, and then we've taken these male positives and made a sort of negative mold, and that's the stomuka as we tried to hang it up uh, and realize it was actually huge. <laughs> um, uh, and yeah, here we are. Here's Adam. Here's Adam who's done a huge amount of work there in the workshop making the molds and has done a fantastic job, so thank you very much, Adam. Um, the process what we, which we were using was to encase the entire object in uh, up to kind of 10 mil of silicon built up in layers and layers and layers. And that corn forms a kind of floppy kind of but it's hyper detailed uh, molds, and then that's reinforced with glass fiber. And you can see there that's the top surface of one as it's just had a fresh layer of silicon based on it, and it's all sorts of amazing colors. And from there, um, you can see this is what we do we make the mold watertight completely and add a little air hole for the top and seal it, pour in the water and the ice and let it freeze, and then to get it out, we've got to cut it open. So this is one that's just had its eyes removed, and that makes it a complete and beautiful watertight seal that means they don't leak, although they did leak. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you can see the silicon just picks up like phenomenal levels of detail there. So you can see there, that's the resolution of the 3D print as it's kind of been contoured, as it's been built in the machine. Um, just to explain a little bit how the 3D prints are made, they're uh, an SLA, technique, which I'm sure a lot of you are very familiar, but uh, it's essentially a resin that's cured with UV light. So the layers are very, very thin. They're less than 0.1 of a millimeter thick. So the detail you can get is, is really lovely. So once we've got our silicon interior, this is the fiberglass exterior on the outside, and this is all kind of ready to freeze. As you can see, we've placed blocks of clear ice inside the center of it to really speed up the process. Um, the, this one here, which is the Stamuka, would take us about seven days-ish to freeze. If we'd started with fresh water, it probably would have taken us about three weeks. So we needed to kind of catalyze the freezing process by adding in ice into the center already. Oh, uh, so this is us in our freezer container in Hackney Wick, uh, which was a rather chilly minus 25. Uh, as we top up the molds and fill them with water. Now, um, the only uh, ice cubes I'd made previous to this were the little ones out of racks that you'd put in your freezer, and they're always cloudy. And what we really wanted to do was make perfectly clear ice. Um, and so that w proved quite a technical challenge for us. Uh, there's a whole array of fascinating scientific uh, bits of information that you need to know to be able to do that. And we spent about a month and a half banging our heads against the wall and speaking to people and testing things and it was a lovely process. Um, I'll give you away a few secrets, but uh, what you need to do is uh, have very, very pure water. Any of the minerals or dirt or uh, ions that are dissolved in water cause little seeds onto which crystals can grow. Uh, and those crystals grow quite quickly when they're tiny seeds. So 
that causes all of the whiting and all of the trapped air that you can see that causes ice to be opaque. If you shrink down and make those ice crystals as small as possible, it becomes perfectly clear. And so that's our aim, is to keep the crystals really small. Uh, and the slower and the longer you take to make those crystals, the better. So by moving the water in these molds, the ice was perfectly clear because it took so long for those crystals to form. And it's actually kind of more akin to growing uh, than it is freezing. You start and the, the ice forms on the outside of the mold and slowly progresses towards the center. Um, and that's why we have an open top because as it freezes, the impurities are kind of pushed and you need for the, those impurities to go somewhere. The, to go somewhere, otherwise they get trapped in the center and cause a, a kind of opaque middle. Um, at that point, we got kind of bored with making perfectly clear ice, so we've also begun to mix it up a bit, add some other materials into there, add uh, just normal Thames water into blocks, and add that mixed with all of the clear ice that we've already got. So you can see here, the, all that white and mess kind of interlinked with beautiful clear pieces of ice. So it's, uh, it's been an amazing process. Um, and that's another lovely shot where you can see exactly what I was talking about there. Um, so we've made all these pieces of ice and we were very aware that to keep them there uh, would require refrigerating the room. But that wasn't really what we wanted to do. We wanted to kind of take process and interest in the fact that these are temporary things and it also kind of coincides with some of our opinions about what's happening in the polar regions and it also allows uh, a platform for all sorts of discussion. So we've allowed them to melt and obviously the consequences of that is that we want the water to be captured and stay in the space. So uh, beneath each of the plinth is a steel box perfectly um, fabricated to be almost the exact volume of the ice above it. Uh, and we've just placed little drip, kind of almost gargoyles on the corners of each of these plinths so that the water will rush down them. And uh, as we found out, it's actually quite a loud and quite beautiful noise as you're in the gallery space. You can see all these. Uh, obviously that. Um, and then we should just explain a little bit about these. Um, this is the scientific information that the was recorded. So these are all the drill holes and all of the core samples that we made. And we wanted to visualize that and incorporate that into the ice. So we've had all of that CNC'd out of uh, it's here as a, as a trespa panel. Uh, and we've had these built as objects that can hold themselves up. So there's little extended legs on them. And these are almost memories of the information that is still there about these pieces of ice, which will still be there long after this ice has all reformed, refrozen, melted, or is now back in the North Atlantic. Um, and a thank you to Sammy, <laughs> who pops up here, who's been absolutely fantastic. And the drawing that we uh, were talking about earlier is also uh, a piece of her very hard work. So thank you very much. Um, it's one thing that we need to make clear, here, and I think is an important point, is that the ice we've put out there uh, has been scaled um, due to the fact that these things are literally just the ocean freezing over they're super thin and the drawing on the wall kind of shows you that as, as a diagram the darker more filled in shapes are one to one uh, or by it being scaled to one to 100 they are not exaggerated whereas the line that dips down beneath it is uh, uh, exaggerated in the z direction so we've timed them by seven uh, and that's also to make them last longer than about half an hour in the space. So, and that is very akin to what a lot of the scientists, the Till and Nick, do to data, is they exaggerate it in that direction so they can identify patterns and movements and uh, textures within that. So that's what we've done there, and these diagrams help explain some of that. And I think that's it. Wow, we've got another little secret project. Are we going to... Should we... How? Should have we, we got time, or should we... I think we should wrap it up. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we've got two options. We can tell you what's going next. Should we just take two questions? Or we can yeah. Oh, electric shock there. <laughs> um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you both very much. That was...
that was really, that was very brilliant and interesting. I, one thing that struck me when you were talking is the kind of moral dimension, actually, of scanning and recording landscapes, and it's something we've talked about before. The kind of uh, the positive story where you can record something like the Forensic Architecture Project and actually tell the truth about a landscape and something's happened. But also my kind of worry, which I know I've mentioned before, is that I, I, you wonder if by recording something and scanning it, it then acts in lieu of the actual landscape, like in terms of the architect with it being lost, and you talk about designing posthumously. Do you think there's a danger where this technology will be used kind of in lieu of actually worrying about saving a particular landscape? Yeah. Sorry, that's a very hard question. <laughs> No, I mean, I think it's definitely something, especially working with, with Greenpeace, that has started to come up again and again and again, that there can't be this kind of um, idea given that, well, it doesn't matter because it's gone. We've got the digital record of it. It's fine. Um, I think it's one of the reasons why we're so kind of pleased in a way that we've gone through the making process in this project here, because it's as soon as you get these objects out of a computer again and into physical materials, then they start to exhibit their real properties again. So, for example, when you walk into that room, you can feel a cold draft coming from the ice there. And so, uh, in a, on a larger scale, yeah, I think there's a massive danger of, of people kind of um, uh, taking that opinion on. But then I think you can prove very quickly that, it, that so much of the um, atmosphere and content of a place is lost. And it's, no, it's not just about this kind of surface bit of detail and a bit of color, really. Um, so it's something that we, with the other project that we were going to dabble onto there as well, it's all about getting scan stuff back out into the real world and kind of making it up in the real world. On a larger scale, not our projects, um, I think there's, yeah, there's definitely a kind of, uh, on, what, on the one hand, quite interesting catalogue of scan spaces that will start to exist, that will start to allow people who would never get to go to these places to go to those places, which is hopefully a kind of beneficial thing and allow scientists to kind of sit and study those places when they can never c get to them or certainly can't, c can't unfortunately go there on a Greenpeace ship continuously. They're, they have to kind of work on these things remotely as well. So there's benefits to it, but there's, there's, there is this kind of worrying um, theme that people think that they, they replace the real things because the accuracy is so uncanny. Yeah. I wonder whether because people will get more and more used to seeing these kind of uncanny and, and kind of strangely realistic replicas, maybe people will get s used to it and then they'll realize that they're just scans. Yeah. <laughs> because at the moment, I think, because people don't quite know what they are, mm -hmm. they maybe got a little bit, people embody them with even more power than they've actually got, <laughs> maybe. Yeah. Yes, okay, on that note, has anyone else got any questions they'd like to ask Matt and Will? Or you can quiz them later in the gallery on the secret project that they didn't show us because I <laughs> was shaking my head. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone like to ask any more questions? Yeah. Yep. Hello, just was wondering, in terms of the scanning idea from the camera, yes. is that the camera that you use for, for your work? I'm assuming you're scanning and it's taking away the images from the camera, or do you use a separate camera for your work? It varies on from project to project um, and on lighting conditions and all sorts of things. But we, we quite often use an external camera to get really good photographic quality as well. And there's kind of pluses and minuses, a time minus when you start to take other sets of photographs as well. Um, one of the tricky things is consistency of lighting as well, because you're, you're doing a photo shoot, but you're doing it quite often across the course of a day or a series of days. Um, and the lighting conditions change so much then. So to get a consistency of light, even across the course of a day, quite often you'll see um, on a site scan for us, you can tell where we started because the shadows are from the morning sun and you can tell where we finished because the shadows are from an evening sun. And across the course of a day, or sorry, across the course of a scan, you'll see the lighting patterns of a day. Um, so, so yeah, we use both, I guess. Um, and, and some scanners have an inbuilt camera, some just don't have one. Are the, are the resolutions in the scanners for, are they good for those things? Is that what you're the resolution of the scanner or of the, the, of the, the, camera, the camera? At the moment, they're pretty, they're okay, but they're not at the same resolution of the 3D information. They said the pixels, the visual pixels are bigger than the, than the physical pixels, if you see what I mean. So, but I think if you tried to take an image that had a, that many color pixels as well, it would be a 12 gigabyte, just one of those photos. So.
it's kind of going to be a, a balance between those two things. We do spend a lot of our time, unfortunately, battling with these enormous data sets and these enormously kind of complex processing workflows. But hopefully the results are pretty. <laughs> yeah, they certainly are. Um, I'd just like to end by thanking you both. Thank you, Matt and Will. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much.